Good day from, from Miami Beach, Dr. Bennett for Neurosurgical TV. We have the second in today's lecture of Neurosurgical Operative Anatomy. And I'll let Samer take over. Go ahead, Samer, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Go ahead, Samer, could you please introduce uh, what you want to do, please? Yes, I'm Samer Hoys, I'm from Iraq. Uh, we are uh, in the uh, lecture uh, six of, the, of our series the neurosurgical operative anatomy. Today's topic is about the anatomical variants or variation, and it's important uh, for surgery. It's an anatomical topic that should be studied, and there is an application within the surgery. Uh, today, I have uh, the honor uh, to present uh, uh, as interactive uh, presentation with uh, uh, my mentor and uh, colleague, Dr. Wamir. Mati, uh, he's a neurosurgeon from Iraq. Welcome, Dr. Wamir. Thank you, Dr. Samar. It's nice to be here. Thank you. And uh, uh, I will go through slides, then uh, Dr. Wamir will comment on some topics that we already prepared. And uh, I should say welcome to the panelists also, Dr. Marco and Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Kabul. So, uh, I will start to with the sharing the slides. Okay. So okay. it's lecture perfect. perfect. It's lecture six out of ten about the neurosurgical operative anatomy. I hope it will be uh, a continuous and small videos that will be helpful for the young uh, resident or the or maybe the young neurosurgeon that need refreshing. And today topic about the anatomical variants. And as always, um, so. okay. So uh, about the anatomical variants, there there is a, uh, a lot of variation in every anatomical structure, and uh, in the brain there is more and more variation. Why? Because every millimeter is matter within the brain, because already the field is about 20 to 30 millimeter in width. So every variation is, uh, should be countable. And uh, to study the anatomy alone will not uh, uh, bring you uh, the field that you want uh, to, or, or bring you the information that you want to have in mind while doing surgery. So always the, there is an uh, uh, urge or need to study the anatomical variation, but what to study or how to study, I think the best is to study topic by topic. So if, if I am reading about the uh, intercommunicating artery aneurysm surgery, let's say, because it's the prototype of aneurysm surgery, uh, so always it will be the example. Uh, I should be aware about the different variation and what's the implication of each type of variation on the, in the surgery. Does this variation is matter or just it's a change in the shape? That's the big question that should be kept in mind. And there is uh, a lot of variation within circle of fullness uh, that may be related to the uh, fetal regression of some arteries. Some arteries may be uh, stay like the uh, fetal posterior communicating artery configuration, one of the most important uh, uh, normal anatomical variant that should be kept in mind, and like the trigeminal, primitive trigeminal artery. These are examples that should be studied and kept in mind while doing uh, surgery and actually while reviewing uh, the radiology of the patient just before the surgery to know your patient uh, uh, anatomy, what's the specific anatomy for your patient and if, it, if, it, if he has some variation in the anatomy and which type and uh, this will affect the surgery or not. So these are the questions that should be kept in mind and uh, there is a, a, a nice article discussing uh, this topic in specific and I uh, address uh, these two articles or maybe more in this presentation just to keep in mind and maybe for uh, if anybody need to go for them and um, dig in details. These are some examples, anatomical variation of arterial circulation of the brain, 
the patient with and without intracranial aneurysm. That's interesting. I think Turkish article and another uh, article about the presence of normal anatomical variants of arterial circulation in patients with intracranial aneurysm and the real implication. Uh, more and more about variation of circular follicles and its relation with the rupture and the rupture and uh, the association of the vascular variation. There is a lot of vascular variation like atresia, like uh, over tortuosity, like fenestration. And uh, I will try to give uh, a few examples uh, that you should, um, for the beginner they should keep in mind that not only the pathology like this, this these are the type or, uh, or the variation in the shape of aneurysm, these are the variation of the pathology, but we, what we need more is the variation of the normal anatomy. Maybe not in such details with, with, the, with the parts of millimeter for, for each artery, but some illustration like this about the types of uh, anterior communicating artery for the row, the first row, the upper row, showing the types of anterior communicating artery, different types. That it's very important, and the most important is the name of this type because you should know the name of the type of anterior communicating configuration to search for it in articles. Like, uh, uh, let, let's say in the last uh, figure, there is a triple or a zygous. Uh, anterior cerebral artery that you should know that uh, this is named as a zygous and go through literature searching for a zygous anterior cerebral artery and its implication what should I prepare for my patient uh, maybe in the zygous it's very terrifying to do temporary clip because it's only a single artery or maybe if you not, don't notice that the artery is already a zygous part two or A2, uh, uh, you, you will keep doing, uh, uh, or you will keep searching for the contralateral A2 during the surgery and the patient didn't uh, uh, have such an artery. Uh, that's the idea. When you have an azygous, so there is two A1, uh, one A2, and should be kept in mind and it will make the surgery not totally different, but with, with, will have a lot of modification. So I think this slide with the names will be more important for pay, for person doing with uh, and, uh, anterior circulation aneurysm or anterior communicating artery aneurysm. And uh, in reality, there is 27 different variation in the com anterior communicating artery. Maybe not all of, all of them are applicable. Some are rare, but the, uh, the slide uh, will show the different variation and uh, maybe just not studied in detail, but should be kept in mind. Another example of anatomical variant, that's something I, I, I really uh, like to search for fenestration in the arteries. That's a, a picture showing fenestrated proximal basilar artery, as, as you can see uh, here. It's a... Uh, some paper say that it's up to maybe 30% of the uh, intracranial arteries have uh, uh, fenestration and some paper uh, uh, showing less percent. So always should be kept in mind that some artery may have fenestration because such fenestration have an, an implication. Uh, the point of fenestration will be weak as demonstrated by this slide that the point of fenestration will be way weak and more prone to develop aneurysm at this position. And this slide is an example of uh, fenestrated basilar artery aneurysm, which means that fenestration within the aneurysm. This is a surgical challenge that you have two trunk. You should keep both of them intact. And even from a neurointerventional point of view, this is an important anatomical variation that should be kept in mind. And even there is some classification of aneurysm related to this fenestration. That's just to give you some idea about how, how important this fenestration. And actually, we are conducting two articles. Both of them are, are under submission now about multiple intracranial aneurysm, uh, sorry, multiple intracranial 
arterial fenestration and their clinical significance. It's an overview of the reported cases. And another article, I think it's an interesting one, non-aneurysmal cerebrovascular condition associated with intracranial arterial fenestration. Because as I said before, that usually the fenestration connected to the formation of aneurysm, but there is some reported cases showing that lesions, the, the, there is lesions other than the aneurysm may be also related to the fenestration, something like AVM, arterial venous malformation. That's the idea about the fenestration, that's our example. And I'll now get to the final example that's maybe classical for me. I like this case uh, because it's a surgical challenge. It, it's uh, uh, surgery depend, uh, the decision of surgery depends purely on the anatomy. If you see it's a middle cerebellar peduncle cavernoma, this is a cavernoma in the middle cerebellar peduncle and some sections, it's uh, the anterior end will be within the bones in some section and pure and cerebellum. So, uh, if you, uh, if, we, if we are discussing before the operation for this case, from where we can approach this uh, lesion, which is the cavernoma, there is a three approaches mentioned in the book that the most preferred approach is telovillar approach through the fourth ventricle, then get through this fissure laterally to the lesion and remove it on this approach. Uh, uh, advocated by Spitzler, Robert Spitzler, which is the more safe one. A second approach for such lesion, actually, it's not mentioned, but uh, as, as you can uh, uh, imagine in this case, that may be approachable from CPA, from cerebellar pointan angle, I, I mean through retrosigmoid approach, but I think it, it will cause a lot of damage. I think it's a risky approach, so I do not consider this approach as a uh, a safe one for this lesion. And the third approach, which is, which is the classic one, to do a transcerebellar approach to evacuate the cavernum. So, first of all, the best approach is telovillar or maybe part of transfermian approach through the fourth ventricle and removing the cavernum. And I think there is a two or three video of Robert Spitzler showing a removal of such cavernum in this way. And another approach may be transcortical and transcerebellar transcortical transcerebellar approach, and third one, which may be not safe in such cases, uh, as a retrosigmoid approach. This is how we discuss uh, the surgical option before the surgery in such case. But if you consider more image of the same case, this is the same case, but in a lower section, this is uh, the, or maybe a, a, an upper section, this is the lesion hyperintense signal just medial to the cavernoma so usually for those knowing uh, this association this is not a lesion this is um, a developmental venous anomaly usually uh, occur in, uh, in associate or located in association with the cavernoma especially in the posterior fossa and i think robert Spitzler said there is always a cover a, a dva i mean developmental venous anomaly uh, related to cavernoma. So, uh, the presence of this DVA may preclude the surgery through the midline, I mean the telopillar or the transverminal approach, because this DVA, the development of the venous anomaly, should be preserved. This is a normal variation. That's the topic of our lecture, a normal variant that should be preserved and affect the surgery. That's the idea. If we get more image of the same case, so this is I think it's very interesting how large this developmental venous anomaly or, or venous angioma, it's very large draining vein arising from within the cerebellar tissue posteriorly, going anteriorly, convert to large trunk and ascend up between the cerebellum and bones to be drainage into the ganglion venous system. And where is the cavernoma that we are discussing? It's here, it's just below and anterior. So this DVA will be in the way of the cavernoma if, if you are approaching this cavernoma from the midline. That's the idea. And actually one of my uh, colleagues said that this is another basilar artery, but behind the brainstem, not in front of the brainstem, just joking. So that's a very large DVA. 
and if uh, somebody need to recall it, the DVA are the venous angioma or developmental venous anomaly. These are one of the most common vascular uh, lesion within the brain, but actually these are not lesion, are normal variant, draining normal brain tissue and should be preserved. And sometimes we call it the caput medusae uh, orientation. The caput medusae uh, is uh, the maybe Romanian uh, gut uh, with the hair of snakes. That's the uh, idea because this is the shape of uh, the venous angioma. So we, for the same case, we dig in the angiography and we found this. Yes, this is the developmental venous anomaly draining into the cavernous, and this is the medusa shaped head. These are like a small snakes converged together. That's the, the typical variation that we found in this case. It's very interesting. Actually, uh, it changed a lot from our decision and uh, from this. A lesion that looks benign and with no contraindication for any approach and to, from this uh, lesion with the medially protected by the DVA. So we decide to attack the lesion posteriorly transcortical. I think it should be better by navigation, but at that time we don't have a navigator. So we depend on the external anatomy. We expose the cerebellum from end to end. The, uh, the the cerebellar hemisphere from end to end, and we are trying to just do a microscopical uh, uh, transcortical approach, millimeter by millimeter after reaching the cavernoma, and we remove it. So this is the pre-op with the cavernoma, and this is the post-op. I think four months was the operation. The patient is also doing well. That's our uh, last example, maybe about the. And uh, importance of anatomical variants and association. Oh, and I put this slide like a quiz, uh, maybe not that clear one, but this is an angiography of the uh, uh, of the three D reconstruction CT angiography, uh, showing bilateral carotid, and there is abnormality, maybe not detected for the first time, but if you dig in detail. The artery that go to the brain are only two. This is the basilar artery coming from the vertebral artery, and this is the internal carotid artery, and there is a tragia or a plagia of the internal carotid artery in the right side. That's the idea. If you get a closer look, this is an anterior communicating artery aneurysm arising uh, from the transverse anterior communicating artery, and what's this? This is the carotid artery on the right side, giving middle cerebral, anterior cerebral A1, then the anterior communicating. And what's interesting in this case, that the middle cerebral artery on the other side also gets its blood from the right side. If you get the idea that this carotid artery is absent congenitally, congenitally, so it's uh, an aplasia of the internal carotid artery in the left side, and the right internal carotid providing both hemisphere, both anterior cerebral artery, and uh, both middle cerebral artery by blood. That was a real surgical challenge. Actually, the patient go elsewhere. I don't know uh, uh, if he did the surgery or not, but we are discussing uh, the patient a lot because uh, if you want to do a coiling or a clipping for such a case, it will be a real surgical challenge because if you are doing a temporary clip on this A1, on the right A1, as an example, you are blocking both anterior cerebral artery and the contra contralateral middle cerebral artery by this temporary clip. So I think it, it's an interesting one. It shows the importance of variation and how the operative uh, decision may be changed by the anatomy of the patient. I think if, we, if I am operating this case, I will do it without using the temporary clip because it will be very risky. And I will try not to uh, put a large clip because kinking of the neck of such aneurysm may cause kinking of the or uh, blocking of the mainstream of the anterior communicating artery. And in this case, the anterior communicating artery provides the blood to the contralateral hemisphere. That's 
totally different from the classical cases. And the next lecture will be the colorful and geometrical operative anatomy and what's the importance of colors of like the color of arteries and veins and within the operative field it will be totally operative and I will try to combine it with uh, uh, maybe lecture seven also to complete the series to make it available for all. Always surgeries, anatomy, and hemostasis, and in such difficult situation, especially in your beginning, you need a lot of a lot of mentors. Even not even one mentor, maybe because such surgical challenge is not a challenge for surgery alone. It's you are dealing with a life of, of the patient. That's why uh, doing such big uh, steps uh, under uh, supervision, it will be safe for you as a surgeon, beginning your career and save for your patient. And um, thank you. Oh, excellent, Sarah, another great presentation. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to the panel for comments or, uh, or questions. I have one question. Go ahead. Yes, thank you so much for excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned like uh, those variants of uh, arteries. You mentioned like uh, you can have sometimes hypoplastic uh, um, anterior cerebellar artery. My question was, how can you differentiate that to a uh, vasospasm in a patient with no previous uh, angio? How can you differentiate that hypoplastic artery with uh, a vasospasm? Okay. Uh, actually, the uh, your question: How can you differentiate the vasospastic artery? I think uh, this is your question, Dr. Kabulu. Yes. How can you differentiate the vasospastic artery and hypoplastic artery after subarachnoid hemorrhage in a patient without previous uh, angiographic okay. study? Okay, I get you. I get your idea, but. Uh, uh, just to keep uh, in mind that the uh, vasospasm occur usually in the parent artery where, or near the aneurysm where the clot is maximum uh, or the epicenter of the clot located. If you are dealing with an anterior complicating artery and there is a large uh, A1, let's say, and a small uh, A1 epsilateral and a small A1 contralateral, and the direction of aneurysm where would be expected? It should be on the contralateral side. Uh, I, I, I want to simplify that for you, that uh, the spasm will occur in the dominant side, that the uh, location of the spasm, while the atresia usually on the opposite side. And you can know that, not definitely, but you can have a clue from the direction of aneurysm, you know? If, Usually, the direction aneurysm directed to the hypoplastic one. So, so if you find a, a small vessel and the aneurysm goes with the direction of that vessel, this means that this vessel is congenitally small. Otherwise, the spasm usually occur in the uh, in main artery that giving the aneurysm. So, it will be on the opposite side. Thank you. Dr. Mati, do you have any comments or? Okay, let me unmute you there. I muted you there. Go ahead, Dr. Mati. Thank you, Dr. Samuel, for your great presentation. It's really on a very important subject. Uh, it goes uh, here from uh, knowing the fact that 20% of the population have complete circle of loss. From that, you, you can judge that 80% have uh, their uh, anatomical variations. And those anatomical variations ranging from the fetal persistent fetal circulations, like the most common one, the fetal picon, and uh, the many circulation uh, variation that uh, goes to the arteries, the main cerebral arteries. Like you have said about the anterior cerebral artery, we have seen the azygous A1, which is present in about 2% of the population, in which you have a single A1, and during the surgery, if you don't know that there is a single A1, you are going to look for the other A1, which is really, we have uh, only seen absent 
I want just in the in the azagas uh, anterior cerebral artery. Uh, there is also the uh, accessory A2. We have seen that there is a three A2, and there is the bihemispheric anterior cerebral artery in which you only have a single A2. So this understanding this uh, these facts uh, will help you in the surgery. This uh, comes from uh, studying the anatomy on the imaging or from the pre-op and planning it ahead. You know that from the pre-op, the CT angio, or if you have the catheter angiogram, in which you can plan your surgery, what, what you are going to do, which vessel you are going to dissect first, which vessel you are going to do the temporary clipping first. Uh, all of this uh, comes from the planning on the uh, pre-operative imaging. This is number one, when you come to the anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral artery, we have seen the duplicated uh, middle cerebral artery in which you have from the bifurcation two middle cerebral arteries, or when we have an accessory M2 uh, going from the ACOM, it arises from the anterior cerebral artery near the anterior communicating. And in this case, you have to differentiate it from the recurrent artery of Hubner because there will be two arteries arising from the anterior communicating artery near the anterior ACOM. Uh, these, these principles comes from, again, from studying the preoperative imaging. Uh, this is uh, from uh, the point of view about uh, variations. Uh, regarding your case on the middle cerebral uh, peduncle cavernoma, we know that, uh, as Dr. Rotten said, the best approach to the middle cerebral peduncle is from the uh, cerebral pontine angle, the CPA, while approaching the superior and inferior middle uh, cerebral peduncles comes from the uh, fourth ventricle. Uh, here you have uh, the showing near the fourth ventricle, not near the CP angle, right? So going from the CP angle will uh, may disrupt the middle cerebral peduncle fibers. Uh, you, may ca you can attack it from the, cerebra the cerebellum, then going into the middle cerebral peduncle or, or choosing the long trajectory through the foliate transcerebellar in which you have uh, a navigation at least, like the ultrasound, something that can guide you straight to the cavernoma not going superiorly or inferiorly and missing it. Thank you. Uh, just one second, Samer. Let me introduce someone uh, that uh, one of your students in Japan, he's now in Chicago, uh, Simon Downs. I'd like you to say hi to Samer. Hello, Sam and Dr. Haas. It's a pleasure to be here and see you again, and I hope to participate more in the future. Hello, hello, Sam. Uh, Sam uh, hello, Simon met Sam in uh, one of the centers of, of, uh, Tokyo. We met in Tokyo. of uh, aneurysm surgery, Japan. We went to a big together. center for yeah. it. They, they met each other in Japan, and now Simon's doing rotations in medical school in Chicago. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very humbled to be here, and I'm learning so much. Thank you. Okay, very good. Dr. Yeah, Mati, do you want to continue uh, what you were saying or do you want to go on, Samer, or what, what do you want to do? Yeah, no, no, thanks. Uh, I have said uh, what I really okay. want to do. Very good, very good. We just have celebrities popping in from all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> like Simon. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, now, you went to Japan uh, uh, you did a fellowship, right, for a month in, in Japan, uh, Samer? For three months, yes. Three, three months, months, okay, three months. Uh, do you want to, uh, did you learn a lot over there, Samer? For sure. One of the best places maybe after the States uh, to learn surgery is in Japan. That yeah. was a, a wonderful experience. And... Uh, it's interesting that the vascular pathology, especially of the brain, are predominant in Japan, in the, in the ethnicity of the Japanese people. So they have more vascular uh, diseases than other population. That's why if you are doing fellowship on vascular there, you will see a lot of rare cases. That's the idea. So that's the allure, because a lot of the big neurosurgeons in the world, as you know, like Sherian, uh, I was Sufi and off. They've done time in Japan. It seems that the the big neurosurgeons in the world go to Japan to do a fellowship for a while. Uh, so I guess it's so it was a combination of the population having a lot of aneurysms, as well as the technical skill of the Japanese uh, neurosurgeons. I guess. Yes. Yes. 
You probably have you seen some case of Moya Moya Daisa Daisa's disease, right? Yes. Very That's common. why. <laughs> yes. Maybe I, I talked uh, that before. Um, in the previous uh, presentation, or maybe for two, that uh, in the last week we did uh, our first case of Moya Moya. Uh, maybe it's the first one. Uh, first case. First one you've seen in Iraq? Yes, maybe for us, uh, maybe the second one or the first one in Iraq. That's okay. very rare. Even to diagnose such disease, it's a rare entity, and to do surgery is more uh, challenging. But in Japan, uh, was if not on weekly basis it will be on monthly basis that's the difference okay dr mm -hmm. sana i have a question again go ahead yes thank you um my question is i wanted just to know how do you differentiate the first bleed in case of cavernoma let's say a cavernoma a brainstem cavernoma which bleed for the first time you do your mri uh, you see that bleed. How do you differentiate that bleed to a, like a brainstem stroke or like intracerebral cavernoma? How do you differentiate the first bleed to a stroke or other hemorrhage for the first one, first bleed? I don't know if my question is clear. Yes, yes. I don't know if it's clear, but maybe, maybe I don't answer exactly that how to differentiate from stroke i don't know because we are dealing with the recurrent bleeding from cavernoma that's the only indication of surgery for brainstem cavernoma that's the idea that if cavernoma bleed once so it's still on a uh, neurological aspect of the management not the neurosurgical aspect uh, the indication of surgery for brainstem cavernoma will be a progressive symptoms uh, plus there is repeated hemorrhage. That's the difference. That will be a surgical, uh, maybe a surgical indication. But but I think the challenge maybe in the next uh, lecture I will show an interesting case. The challenge for cavernoma diagnosis is that uh, if, if there is a large developmental venous anomaly, as the one I showed in, in the lecture, and there is like a large vein from the DVA associated with the cavernoma. Sometimes it will be similar to AVM. Uh, and uh, I did actually maybe last week a case that the radiology report was AVM, arteriovenous malformation of the cerebellar AVM. And they say that the venous drainage goes to the CPA, goes to the petrosal venous system. But uh, as we review the radiology later, we decide that this is an uh, this is a cavernoma, and this large vessel is only a developmental venous anomaly. It's not an AVM. And we operate on that principle that uh, we, we go to the surgery and we resect it, and it's only cavernoma. That's the idea that cavernoma, if it's located just close to a large developmental venous anomaly, it will be similar to AVM. That will be a diagnosing challenge, and even a surgical challenge that you should prepare for both scenarios. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Samuel. I was asking this question because I had the case of a 22-year-old male who, who is a baba, who started uh, vomiting the time he was shaving his client, was vomiting, as I'm vomiting. After a few minutes, he became hemiparetic. He, has, he had the left-sided hemiparesis, and he was now losing consciousness was taken to a local clinic where they noticed that the BPs were very high. Then from there, they transferred the patient to us. We did the first uh, MRI scan, which showed a midbrain bleed, uh, which was like a posterior midbrain bleed extending to, to the pons. So my question was, um, for the first bleed like that, uh, how do you radiologically, how do you differentiate? Can you already make a diagnosis of a cavernoma for the first bleed, or you need to repeat uh, your imaging after days for you to see that uh, hemosidering rim, or there is a way of diagnosing a cavernoma for the first bleed. So that was a challenging case. We were like uh, we were discussing with physicians. Others were saying it could be a midbrain stroke. Others were saying it can be a, a brainstem cavernoma. So that my question was: Is there a way 
radiologically of differentiating those two in a case of like the first bleed? Yes, yes. I, I, I will give uh, my opinion and I would like to listen to uh, Dr. Marco and maybe Dr. Ahmed's opinion about this topic that mm -hmm. if you have a, a bleed in, let's say, the brainstem, or and how do you know that it's a stroke or uh, cavernum mm -hmm. or have a diagnosis, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for intracerebral hematoma, like any, for any hematoma within the brain, uh, usually we, we do not uh, uh, have a, a wide spectrum of diagnosis at, at initial. Usually either it's lesional or non-lesional. If it's lesional, so it's either AVM or cavernoma. If it's non-lesional, uh, which I mean like basal ganglia hypertensive hemorrhage, like amyloid angiopathy, these are non-lesional ICH. The difference is that the non-lesional uh, have a classic location or territorial location, like the stroke. The stroke should be on a territory of a specific artery. There is no artery supplying any part of the brainstem without supplying the cerebellum, let's say, like the, the medial medullary syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome. These are strokes usually involving part of the brainstem <coughs> and part of the cerebellum. You, you don't have uh, uh, the, the same uh, anatomical territory uh, with the cavernum or the AVM. If you get my idea that stroke should follow a vascular territory, AVM or cavernoma not, and uh, AVM or cavernoma, these are clear hemorrhage, there is no stroke around, and the most important, there is no edema. That's, that's, that means because cavernoma bleeds inside the capsule, it's not usually a large bleed outside. That's my opinion, and I would like to know. You, Dr. Samuel, will you allow me? To, to share the, the, the image of that patient? Sure, sure, we'd love that. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, thank you. So let me share, we did that, the MRI, the first MRI, then we did also CT Anjo. So, hope you are seeing. Yes, we can see it. Okay, I don't know if you can see the image. Not yet. You need to click on the image first, I think. Click on the particular image and open it up. We're just seeing a bunch of images now. Yeah, you should get out of the slide share and get again. You just need to open it's it. Okay. Open it if you can, Dr. Kabulo. Just click on the image. <coughs> If he is clicking the image, and the image will not appear on the slide share. I think you should yeah. on the slide share and get back. Yeah, I think. Are you stuck there, Dr. Kabulo? Yes. Um, um, it could be the bandwidth. Maybe the bandwidth not strong enough. Uh, just, uh, just keep clicking on the image. Yes. Can you see it now? Not yet. Not yet. Can you see it? Just uh, no, no. just get out of the screen share and uh, share the screen again. It's okay. <coughs> Not quite. I'm so, okay. I okay. I can see now. Yeah, you can see it now. Okay. No. I I stop. Okay, now that's I'm good. Right. Now, yeah, now open the image up and then go back. It's okay. So, okay. let me go back. Little trick. Dr. Cavolo, when you uh, open the slide share, you don't, please don't choose the, the files. Go to the picture, see the picture direct. Open the picture before the slide share. Okay, it's okay. I get it. Let me open the picture. You know, while he's doing this, Sam, I'd like to make a remark. Uh, we broadcast uh, Society for Image-Guided Neurosurgery, which is starting, it's a new subspecialty in neurosurgery at John Hopkins. We televised the conference, and they talked about an issue that you're talking about, 
I'll talk about it later after Dr. Kabulo's done. Okay, Dr. Kabulo, okay. go ahead. Yes. Yes. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So that was uh, the first MRI. It was taken uh, one day, two days after the bleeds. Okay. Yes. Then uh, I want also to open the Anjo. Or I can also open um, the axial cut. Okay. <clears throat> so we've, I think we got the process down. We'll get it this time quicker. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Excellent. That's the axial cut. Okay. Then. Uh, uh, can you point out that? Can you see the pathology there, Dr. Cabello? Could you point it out, please? Do you have T1 section? T1. Uh -huh. T1 section, yes, I have them. Let me show you T1. There's the angio, okay. This one? Yes, it's a Sagittarius T1. Yes. Can you see it? Yes, yes, it's clear now. You see the T1? Yes, for sure. Okay, let me now show you the Anjo. Anjo will be negative. Yeah, Anjo was negative. Anjo for sure negative. Yes. So that's the Anjo, which was negative. Sure. Yes. Because both the cavernoma and the AVM are angiographically occult, especially the cavernoma. So nothing will appear on angio. Okay. So you think this is a cavernoma? For me, it's was... a cavernoma, but, but I need to listen to Dr. Marco and Dr. Matti's opinion also. For me, it's a cavernoma, as initial uh, impression. Uh, well, uh, we uh, can uh, start saying that uh, uh, spontaneous bleeding uh, in, a, in brain stem is uh, um, quite unusual. Sometimes when I see bl blood into the brain stem, I think uh, immediately about cavernoma. Uh, and uh, uh, if you, Kabula, want to put the T2 again, uh, I think there is some uh, uh, heterogeneity, uh, some hypointensity uh, hypo into the blading that suggests me about something that bled, so a cavernoma or a tumor, but most unusual, uh, I guess. Um, and even the, the patient is quite young, so if patient is a, a patient with fami familiar history of cavernomatosis, uh, it could be um, a, a suspect um, and angiography is a, is a, is a negative. So we have a, a series of data that suggest hazard for cavernoma. I think in this case, uh, I wait for uh, um, uh, for the evolution of the blading uh, to see the change and to see if there appears something uh, about the cavernoma. So a capsule, uh, um, uh, a, a moral, uh, I don't know it's the exact uh, definition in English language. So the aspect like, uh, um, uh, the classic aspect of cavernoma, no bleeding cavernoma, like with his... Uh, Emocid ring. ring, exactly, but also the uh, little uh, cap capillaries into the cavernoma appears after the, the hemorrhage start to uh, evolve um, uh, on the um, most fluid uh, um, uh, blood. So um, I, in this case, I wait 
uh, at, at least obviously there is no complication like hydrocephalus in this case I put uh, obviously a uh, ventricular drainage uh, to save the patient's life and then I perform a new MRI in this case I don't know if it's your same idea Summer thank you so much you're welcome yes yes totally agree uh, uh, that's uh, what I'm telling uh, telling Dr. Cabolo that uh, yes. for, the, for the diagnosis, for, for the management, you don't need to know if it's cavernoma or not, if it's the first bleeding. You always okay. will manage conservatively, that's the idea, and if it's a uh, large in size compression of the ventricle, you need to do a CSF drainage. That's totally, uh, I totally agree with the Dr. Marco, but just from uh, the discussion point for the imaging, that the first sign, it looks like cavernoma because of the age, because of no edema, and because the anatomical location, and it's not uh, not, not usual for, maybe uh, hemorrhage without cause, maybe that will be the end uh, diagnosis, but uh, for us, we should think of cavernoma, and we should do a gradient echo also, but um, not in the, the acute setting, in the chronic setting, when you are trying to uh, follow the patient. Thank you so much, Dr. Samuel. Maybe my last small question. Do you also perform radio surgery in cavernomas? No, I, <laughs> uh, I think, think that I... Yeah, yeah. Amonites, you mean? I think in midbrain, uh, we if you have uh, the yeah. opportunity to perform surgery with uh, uh, evocate potential, uh, mm -hmm. a good yes. anesthesiologist, uh, you can uh, remove because uh, uh, as uh, also summer was I liked it, uh, you have uh, after cavernoma bleeding an emocidorine shell. So uh, surgery, uh, knowing the uh, entry point of the mesencep mesencephalus uh, is a uh, Obviously, risk your your operating brainstem, of course, but uh, you can uh, it's better better you perform a surgery. You have the, all the opportunity to remove the wall brainstem, the wall so brainstem, the wall cavernoma, mm. uh, and have a, so a good uh, um, uh, recovery for the patients. It's my opinion. Thank you. What's your comment, Doctor Mati? Uh, yes, from, from looking to that imaging, you have the sagittal T1 with the hyper-intense signal. You know that hyper-intense signal in T1 means there is a subacute bleeding. It is not an acute. In the acute setting, the blood will appear iso-intense. In the hyper-acute also, it will appear iso-intense, while in the subacute, early or late, the blood will be subacute. It will be hyper-intense. And uh, in the T2, it is hyper also. So this means it is in the late subacute phase. This uh, case have been done MRI after three to four days of the acute bleeding. This is number one. If we see the distribution is in the midbrain going into the pons and has a showing in the fourth ventricle near the uh, left part of the fourth ventricle. So if you think of uh, surgery in the future, you can access uh, from the median sulcus, the upper part, or from the upper part of the sulcus limitants. These are, these are safe entry zones into the pons uh, this, uh, the middle cerebral epidemic will be far away. It can be accessed to this area. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I am privy to information. Uh, uh, I, I televised, as I mentioned before, a conference from John Hopkins on a new subspecialty of neurosurgery. It's the Society for Image Guided Neurosurgery. And what they're doing, with, you know, as you know, imagery is getting so much better every year, more accurate. It'll be down to the cellular level where this society essentially uh, injects uh, immunotherapy into tumors. They're starting to uh, accurately diagnose exactly where the tumor is, not to the cellular basis yet but it'll be eventually to the cellular basis of where the tumor goes and they'll be able to more accurately inject the medication and diagnose recent bleeds very subtly uh, because as you know the field of radiology is really getting impacted by artificial intelligence and accuracy 
uh, where they'll read an image and they'll, you know, be very accurate, more accurate than a radiologist. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's the future. So anyways, uh, any more comments or... Uh... Okay, Samer, thanks a lot. This, this is, and Dr. Matthew, thank you very much. This is... Thank you. Forever. It's on YouTube for residents and students and the, the people watching. And thanks all for the uh, panelists for coming out. Uh, uh, Mohammed, Dr. Kabulo, Marco, and Dr. Mati, and uh, uh, Dr. Shammer. Thank you very much. We'll end this right now and we'll Thank stick you. around. Thank, Thank you. you. John, I think you all do, guys. Thank you. Thank you.